A very good afternoon to all the participants and delegates. I begin today by acknowledging the contribution of our forefathers who have helped in creating a world based on freedom and human dignity. I extend my respect to people of diverse cultures, faiths and colors and genders and pledge to work for equity, inclusivity, peace and harmony. I, Asika Saw, along with my co-host Rapti Singh, students of DME Media School, welcome you to the sixth edition of world's first seven-day staggered collocation conference, ICANN 6. ICANN 6 is organized by DME Media School in collaboration with the School of Communication and Creative Arts, Deakin University, Melbourne, Australia, and is sponsored by the Indian Council of Social Science Research, ICSSR. This time, ICANN 6 is organized in a staggered format, which will take place at four different venues across India and abroad. Phase 1 will be held in Delhi Metropolitan Education, Noida, from 19 to 21st June, and Manav Rachna International Institute of Research and Studies, Faridabad, on 22nd June. Phase 2 will be in Makhanlal Chaturvedi National University of Journalism and Communication, Bhopal, on 21st July and Daffodil International University, Bangladesh on 5th to 6th August 2023. I would like to take a moment and introduce Delhi Metropolitan Education to our audience. Delhi Metropolitan Education is an A-grade premier educational institute affiliated to Guru Gobind Singh Indraprastha University, New Delhi and approved by the Bar Council of India. DIA Media School is one of the most promising media institutes in the country. It offers BA in Journalism and Mass Communication. It is recognized as a school focused on the growth of its faculty and students through academic and co-curricular activities. ICANN 6 has come with the theme Identity, Culture and Agenda Driven newscast with the hashtag Cultural Identity for Diversity. ICANN 6 has support of more than 21 partners. The conference is sponsored by Indian Council of Social Science Research. Conference partners are IAMCR, Gen Section, GMEC, Global Media, Education Council. Knowledge partners are Manav Rashna International Institute of Research and Studies, Faridabad, Makhanlal Chaturvedi National University of Journalism and, Mass and Communication, Bhopal, Admas University, Kolkata, Institute of Applied Medicines and Research, IMR, Ghaziabad, and Keshif, Keshif Suri Foundation. International partners are Defodil International University, Bangladesh, Institute for International Journalism, Ohio University, USA, Beacon House National University, Pakistan. Media partners are The Policy Times, Jehan Times, Quick News, News 44. ICANN 6 is powered by Asian Media and Cultural Studies Network Australia, Australia India Film Practitioners and Researchers Network Australia, Spark, the Student Council of DME Media School, RIM, Research and Innovation in Media, Research Center of DME Media School, Richmond Fellowship Society, India, Delhi branch. Since 2018, DME Media School has been organizing the international conference ICANN. The themes for the former editions were India and changing aspects of news in ICANN 1, Indian cinema and alternate networks in ICANN 2, issues of community agenda and news in ICANN 3, Information, Communication and Artificial Networks in ICANN 4, Inclusivity, Convergence and Alternative Negotiations in ICANN 5, and now ICANN 6 has come with the theme of Identity, Culture and Agenda Driven Newscast. This unique conference is conceptualized by Dr. Amri Saxena, Professor and Dean of DME Media School. He is the convener of ICANN 6. I invite Sir to deliver his opening address. Sir, please. So in the sixth edition of ICANN, we have entered the third day. And uh, as uh, two days before it was happening, many of you were there in the session, in the auditorium, inaugural session. Jo sixth hour bar bar niche girke nine ho raha So that time the vice chairman <laughs> made this statement. And obviously next step will be, uh, we have to plan for the ninth edition of the uh, conference. And then it will, it will go on and on. 
uh, because consistency is the most important thing whenever we do anything in our lives and this is something which uh, needs to be understood by students as well when they are doing their assignments doing their studies because if you keep on doing certain things then there is a chance uh, of improvement there's a chance of growth not only uh, of you only but then all those people who have uh, come together and who have joined hands to do something good uh, in their life uh, so that is all this uh, session particularly we, we planned very very meticulously all the sessions because going by the theme uh, of the conference uh, and the sub themes also that we decided which uh, we notified in the call for uh, paper brochure so uh, all such issues all such uh, things which are uh, important in our lives and uh, on occasions we discuss that we try to know more about that but then these are the occasions wherein we can invite some distinguished people to talk on those areas wherein we need more information more understanding uh, because that will ultimately lead to our appreciation to those aspects of life and that will ultimately lead to uh, having a better society uh, a better country and uh, the, then, then definitely uh, uh, whatever is positive uh, which is really desirable uh, will happen in our lives and so that is how in today's session in this master class which is on feminism because number of uh, times students keep on asking different things about feminism and it is such a complex and such a such a such a deep rooted concept that we need time to understand this and if for uh, somebody who has an expertise an authority in that area so nobody can be a better person giving you understanding on uh, feminism and then feminism not only as a concept uh, but uh, it has to be looked into how um, it is uh, being seen it's being practiced uh, or what kind of impact it has made uh, on Indian society particularly and uh, we, we often talk about the identity of women in India what exactly is that identity and whatever movements have happened in the name of feminism whether those uh, uh, movements have contributed in some way uh, to making the life uh, of uh, women uh, better in India so these are the issues uh, which uh, professor Methli Ganju will be uh, handling uh, she is a seasoned uh, practitioner turned uh, media educator and researcher and uh, I am pretty sure that uh, the knowledge that she is going to impart to you all and I also expect that a uh, lot of questions should be coming from you if you have that uh, curious mind so that whatever you have in mind uh, with regard to your confusions uh, uh, all those uh, will be removed uh, in uh, this uh, today's talk so I welcome Professor Ganju uh, to spare time to be with us us uh, this afternoon she is also one of the partners and we are having our sessions uh, for the whole day tomorrow on the campus of uh, Manav Rachana International Institute of Research and Studies so I welcome Professor Ganju once again and thank you all thank you so much sir now I invite Professor Dr. Susmita Bala head DME media school to felicitate our guest I am happy to share that journalism at the rate DME is the official newsletter of DME Media School. This fortnightly publication covers all the major activities happening in and out of the campus. It is a student-centric newsletter carried out entirely by them under the supervision of faculty members. DME TV is our official YouTube channel where you can find the playlist related to all the sessions, lecture series, film festivals and conferences. For more information, follow us on our social media handles and YouTube channel DME TV. Today, we all are gathered here for our Master Class 3 on the topic Feminism and Identity of Women in India. The resource person for this session is Dr. Methli Ganju, Professor and Dean, School of Media Studies and Humanities, Manav Rajna International Institute of Research and Studies. Before we proceed ahead, I would like our audience to know more about our session expert. Dr. Mathili Ganju is Dean and Professor at the Faculty of Media Studies and Humanities at Manav Rachna International Institute of Research and Studies, Faridabad. She holds an MPhil PhD in Sociology from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. 
In her three decades of work experience, she worked for in the media industry as a communication strategist and knowledge management specialist with leading media organizations like JWT India, Ogilvy Group. She teaches advertising and PR consumer behavior, brand marketing, film studies and media studies to postgraduate students of marketing and media studies. This year, Manav Rachna International Institute of Research and Studies is a co-host institution and MAM has played a significant role in our partnership. I request Dr. Ganju to take the session forward from here. Ma'am, please. This is one session I have been really looking forward to. Uh, this is more so because uh, although Sir gave very, very generous introduction and, uh, you know, uh, called me uh, somebody who's an expert. My only expertise lies in feminism uh, on the basis of the fact that I am a practicing feminist. I believe in the ideology and uh, therefore uh, I bring what I really believe in. That is really my expertise. And I say this because feminism and other ideologies that one may have are never stagnant for anybody to talk about and anybody to understand. These are uh, thought processes, these are evolving part of what culture is. And therefore, it evolves with each interaction, with each experience. And what I have uh, sort of, I am looking forward to today is to add to my own understanding of what feminism is, what identity is and how women of India identify with their own selves and with the ideology that we are trying to understand. With that, I open my uh, session today. Of course, I have two more things to say, apart from the fact that I'm here to learn from you. The second thing that I want to tell you is there is nothing which is wrong or right when we are in a master class. A master class is always about an interaction and understanding, agreeing to disagree and being tolerant to the other viewpoint. Therefore, if anybody feels that there is something that is not palatable, please do not take it, uh, you know, as the final word. It's an opinion and you are also entitled to yours. So we spend a, a, a minute on understanding how I have curated today's session. Uh, we, I'm going to begin with talking about some of the concepts that you already probably know, but we'll just agree on a few definitions. We'll agree what feminism really means and is understood historically. In case, uh, I mean, I have uh, made up uh, my mind to go through the process in a way that you're already familiar with. I do not want to bring any new concepts, but I want to bring in an approach that you may want to use as you uh, sort of delve on this. We'll uh, then take a tour of the history, which means we will definitely talk about the Western feminist movement from where the entire globe got this idea as a movement. Not feminism as an act, but feminism as a movement is something that the West gave to us. So we will tour that as well. We'll also come to this very important understanding of what women's studies is all about. It is important to understand the academic uh, perspective to a ideology, to a practice, in order to be able to get the researcher's objectivity when we are looking at an issue as contentious as feminism. We will also together create something called the Indian feminism. I shall talk about, I'll give you cues and you will tell me how you want to curate the basic uh, fundamentals of what we understand as Indian feminism. And I say this because this is still an evolving thought. There is still people who are trying to call something feminism and others who take it away from the argument into realms that may or may not be necessary to define feminism. Like a concept called pseudo-feminism, like a concept called men versus women. Now this is very unnecessary to the argument and we shall actually today decide to 
agree upon this if I am able to. Okay? And then as I said, we will also touch upon, upon the cyber feminism because that to my understanding is the future as we all have now entered what we call the fourth wave of feminism in a global context as a movement. So everything is on to the internet and we shall also delve upon that and I am going to look at you people to actually come up and give me more ideas on the context. And then of course I shall leave you with enough thoughts to come up and tell me what is your understanding, what is your definition of feminism. Okay? Is that fine? Is it exciting, not exciting? Yeah? Keep the spirits on. Can we go to the next slide? So, and just wait. So the first very obvious question, what is feminism? And I am sure you all know what it is. So I want you to say something. Yeah. Um, it's the rights and equal opportunities for women and men also. Okay. Uh, so is that feminism? That man thinks woman plays a, a victim card? No. We'll come to that. What is feminism? Equal rights to? To men and women. Only? All gender. All gender. Okay. All right, ma'am. Let's see. So feminism actually, as I said, mean, means million things to million people. Keep reading, I'm not going to repeat that. But it is really about the fact that an ideology which is trying to look for a field level for both men and women. And yes, we are talking in binary because women's um, movement and feminism is something that be that began many many years ago and at that time we were looking at gender as a binary and we definitely made an assumption that uh, women were not getting made an assumption as in we started by talking about it and then proved it that men were getting more space than the women right and if we go forward it leads to only one thing that we are really talking about discrimination. This is to kind of make you a little, uh, you know, your question was somewhere there, right? That men think women play a victim card, right? Uh, so, feminism does not play any cards. Feminism simply tries to look at the aspect of discrimination the discrimination that people, that women have seen over the years happening to them, right? Go ahead, ma'am. Let's now discuss what discrimination means. So, there is something called the direct discrimination. The pink poster here, if you will see, I don't know if you can see from there, really is talking about uh, those pub nights and the DJ nights that we have where women get a free ticket. Are you aware of that phenomena? You must be. So that's quite an obvious thing happening in India as well, where uh, men are invited to pay for a uh, pub night, whereas women are allowed to come free. I'm not getting into the marketing of it, but the fact is that this is a discrimination against men. Why should they pay, pay if women are, come free? Okay, so discrimination is something like this. The indirect discrimination that is out there on the right hand side co uh, corner, can anyone understand what I am trying to say here? What am I trying to say here? Any guesses? I am talking about a phenomena called gendered ageism. What is the concept of a gendered ageism? You will see, for example, in our country, uh, it used to happen in Air India. You know, the air hostesses are normally supposed to be these young women. And it is presumed that you, when you went a certain age, you were not fit for the job. So older women are not given the opportunity. And then go back to the point that we are talking about rights. We are talking about the fact that you know, everybody should have equal opportunities. But here in this case, we definitely are talking about 
ageism and aged gender discrimination okay so is there any other example that comes to your mind we have been fighting for it media is full of it the film the film heroines you see it's it's something that only now that we have accepted that older film women get roles yes please sorry wrestlers okay are you talking about the recent controversy very nice hold the thought we'll come to it i like the fact that you are very very uh, journalistic about this this seems to be a little uh, dated uh, sort of session for you and of course in the last corner where i want you to look because all these things are going to be a part of what you people have in your mind this is about actually workplace harassment workplace harassment could be a simple harassment where you are discriminated because of being a woman or it could even be the sexual harassment about which we will talk when we talk about the indian system okay so basically discrimination here is something that i wanted to put in your mind it is irrespective of who you are however you will see incidents often point fingers towards women being discriminated and why do you think that happens why do you think women get get discriminated either directly indirectly or through harassment do you think women get more discriminated first question boys do you think women get discriminated yeah do you think women get discriminated more than men do women say yes what do men say boys do you feel women get more discriminated do you have any incident of discrimination that you felt as a boy was a uh, was something that you thought was not right it shouldn't have happened i disagree to this as in terms of career choices how we are bound to just uh, uh, choose us uh, be a doctor engineer or some kind of office jobs are preferred okay but that happens to boys also no no yeah ma'am as in a uh, woman ko hamesha yahi kaha jata hai that inhe ghar hi sambhalna chahiye and uh, rather than doing jobs outside and as we uh, like अगर हम जर्नलिज्म का ही एग्जाम्पल लें सो मैम देर आर मैनी वर्किंग जर्नलिस्ट फीमेल वर्किंग जर्नलिस्ट जिनको आफ्टर मैरिज और बींग प्लानिंग द फैमिली उनको ये कहा जाता है दैट टू लीव द जॉब टू क्विट द जॉब बिकॉज उसके टाइमिंग्स मैच नहीं करते एज इन मीडिया हमें ये बोला ही जाता है स्टार्टिंग में कि हमारे लिए कोई टाइम पीरियड नहीं होता जब हमें बुलाया जाता है वी हैव टू रीच द ऑफिस सो फॉर द वुमेन यहाँ पर बहुत प्रॉब्लम आती है फैमिली अलाउ नहीं करते उन्हें मीडिया इंडस्ट्री में वर्क करने के लिए Yeah, very valid point. Also, when you come to do your job, the beats that you get, there are beats which are really for men, and there are beats which are for women. Do you agree? Yes. 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 Yes.
Yeah. So I'm very happy to see you are an emancipated lot that doesn't uh, feel that uh, women are for hat, uh, heart and men are for head because a lot of advertising really happens because they presume that when you are approaching a woman, you have to go with the heart, with the flowers and the, uh, you know, the teddies. Yeah. So you're talking about these are like the stereotypes, right? Okay, yes, you're right. But do you people follow these stereotypes? How many of you follow this? Oh, come on, let's be. I don't know if you want to talk about all this in front of your teachers, but do you guys not uh, celebrate Valentine? No? Come on. <laughs> I still celebrate. <laughs> So don't you think it's like, you know, the mushy, mushy, muchkin thing that girls want? Hey, why do you even have to teach them feminism? They're all so evolved. Yeah? You don't think uh, that women think from heart and men think from head? Is there any man here who thinks uh, with his heart? Okay. Any ma a woman who thinks uh, with her head? See, how nice. Most women are ready to take over, but most men ignore the need and necessity for this takeover. Okay, so let's move and uh, get to understanding the real cause. Okay, the real cause for this entire thing is something called patriarchy. What is patriarchy? Patriarchy, yes. Would you like to define? Yeah. It's an idea. Go ahead. Okay. First, patriarchy is not an idea. Patriarchy also is an ideology. Okay. Ideology is is greater than just an idea. Yes, please. Yes. Yes. So, the idea plus the system makes it an ideology because it is something that people follow without really questioning it. All right. So, patriarchy is an ideology that feminism is trying to counter. All right. And both feminism as well as patriarchy are pretty much abstract in terms of being a part of our culture and socialization, which happens to us the minute we are born. So, a lot of feminist work that you would have read or you would have seen videos of or, you know, general discussion will be really about the fact that women and men are given the roles of being who they are after they are born, right? And that is what, what we call the social construction, which is something that we'll keep talking about as we go there. Therefore, let me ask you another question. This session is really about trying to understand the identity. What is identity in your understanding? Identify. Oh, don't give me literal meaning. What is identity? Um, so rules be who you are that is what identity is for me very nice so basically what happens is that we often mistake identity to be our role so jo society hai, those are our roles if you are a man, you have to be strong. If you are a man, you have to take care. If you are a man, you are not supposed to agree, etc., etc. These are all social constructs. And the woman is taught to be subservient, to listen, zada mat bolo, behes mat karo, etc., etc. So, this is what the social roles are. Now, identity is something that your internal self, who you are, the qualities that you have, the way your inside of you says. So, you are very right, while roles are external, identity is your internal interpretation of how you are going to be 
happy. The ultimate pursuit of this whole life for everybody is happiness, right? Society puts all the norms in order to ensure that there is peace and happiness and an individual does everything that they can in order to feel happy and be accepting of themselves. So, when we are talking about an Indian identity, we are not talking about this one identity. We are talking about all the identities that each one of us has, which we may or may not be understanding, may have not even realized as much. All right, And that is the identity which you are going to at the end of this lecture be able to talk more about. Okay. So, patriarchy therefore, is one such ideology that tells you that the identity is socially constructed, that the roles which the society gives you are the roles that you have to follow. Not only is it problematic because it is coming for so many of us in one straight jacketed format, but also the problem with patriarchy is that it puts the two genders at two levels. Therefore, there is no problem if women were told to stay at home and look after children and have babies etc. etc. The problem is that that work was never counted as work. It was considered to be the duty. Whereas, the work of getting money and being economically independent, which is what the men were supposed to do, was placed as something more meaningful. All right. So, the whole problem of patriarchy is in trying to make an arrangement in which one segment important and 50 percent of segment is marginalized, does not hold that kind of status in our world and life which they deserve. So, when we talk of equality therefore, this is what we are talking about. We are talking about the women's role having as much importance in terms of economics, political and social as men have. Now, for a generation like yours, that is like given, you, you think it is obvious, so what is the big deal? So, what we need to do is go back into the history a little bit to give you an idea about why feminism came into being as a movement and an ideology. The first thing that I want to tell you and this we will say in the Indian context also that feminism as a thought and feminism as an ideology as a movement are two different things. Okay? As a thought this was something that is traced back in the western context. So, the first thing is feminism the concept as we understand it academically is something that came to us from the west and the initial people were the Greek people where there was one poetess who for the first time started questioning excellent poetry and all this is available on the internet you can very well go and uh, read Sappho. Her poetry talks about her poems talk about that internal identity which otherwise is not permissible. So, you see those basic understandings of feminism and gender that develop today in her poetry, poetry which dates back, back, back there only, huh? Huh. Uh, be, uh, dates back to the 570 BC. Okay? Uh, and of course, there are others that you might want to look at. I have put them here so that if anybody is interested, you can take a, a picture and you know look up these people. Because a lot of what we are going to discuss and we talk about has roots here. Among the several women who wrote, and remember, it isn't like Ma Mary uh, Wollstonecraft and Jane Austen are two examples I have picked up, because there are many. There is Simon de Beauvoir. There is a lot of people. I am not picking up all of them because you know about these names. I am picking up these two people because one came from the popular uh, side. Have you read Jane Austen? I am sure you have. What have you read? Which book? Pride and Prejudice and Emma, Emma and 
So you should. Persuasion. There, there are many good books. That's not. That's her, or is that is that the other sister? Uh, huh. Okay. All right. So what are these books talking about? These books, in a very funny way or in an interesting way, talked about the characters which were not falling in the role or talked about the situations which were frustrating in keeping with those roles and somewhere this kind of ideas and thoughts were getting acceptable to the people. Okay? So, hold this thought of how uh, books, popular books and all have a role in changing the way people think. And then of course, we come to Mary Wollstonecraft. Can I have the second one? Yeah. Who actually wrote a very serious document which is this vindication okay where she talked about the fact for the first time somebody said that women are not naturally inferior to men that's why mary wollstonecraft is almost considered to be like the mother of these th thoughts and ideas which were going against those days because look at the dates 1792 can anybody tell me what was happening in india then Huh? Huh? 1792. Which for part? Google? You, oh, you don't have phones, huh? We were getting colonized. We were out of the. We were getting colonized, right? And do you think anything of this kind of stuff was happening in India? There was Girls were also going to school? Okay, we will see. All right. So, this is the time when she wrote about these very bold ideas, which you can read behind me. Let us go back to that. Uh, and Mary Wollstonecraft is somebody who is therefore very important for having sown the seeds of doubt in the minds of the women. Now, it is not one thing that I want to make very clear, it is not that feminism was happening on its own. There was the larger movement of liberal thought. Are you people familiar with, with theories and thinking and you know how Rousseau, uh, have you read about the French Revolution? Yes. So, try to connect everything. Okay? The basic thought of man is free and not to be bound by the monarchy is already happening. But the tr trouble was that it was only about the men. When they said men, they did not include women. And that is how thinkers like Mary and others started thinking that, you know, men have all those rights, they are fighting, they are getting what is due to them. What about us? For women, it was still about being with the, with, with, with the situation that the men had fought against. All right? And that is where these thoughts started coming up. So, what are therefore we talking about? L uh, please read the last line that we, these thoughts are very much happening in the uh, centuries before the 19th, but it is only in the 19th century that such thoughts became a movement and we will go and see what that movement is all about. Next one please. How many of you know about these movements? Do you know the three, four movements, feminist movements of uh, West? Do not Google now. <laughs> huh? Do you people know about these movements? Because then I am not going to spend a lot of time on it. You do not? So, shall I kind of take you through this? So, what happens here? <clears throat> so, people have ideas, but a lot of women were still the way they were. If you go into the depths and I would really tell you to go and look some films on YouTube. There are excellent films made about women in the 19th century in Europe and in America really, where a lot of housewives, their fights to begin with were for very simple things like they wanted warm water in their bathrooms. You know, it was as simple as that because they would they were uh, marginalized working as laborers. 
they would not be getting water for their children which was warm to take a bath because as you know western society western places are quite uh, cold and they need warm water and these were used to be women who would ask for simple thing like that but they were not even allowed to raise such expectations and told to manage with all those big tubs which they sort of uh, for which they had to get firework uh, you know fire sticks and do the fire stuff so no electricity was allowed to make water to give their babies a good bath as simple as that these are very small things in today's context but they were very big things then all this got the women together to understand that even in the house and the patriarchy was one of those examples where the man sits on the table reading a newspaper so all good intellectual things while the woman who's prepared the breakfast just sits waiting and it was these small things that got women to think that why is this happening to us why is our role something that doesn't have any value in the eyes of the men and therefore the society and they realized that the fundamental problem was that they did not have the right to vote so after the french revolution well when there was universal not universal there was suffrage rights given to white men women were still denied and it took them a hundred years to be able to really get it and it is in 17 so, uh, sorry in the 1848 that for the first time the seneca falls uh, convection you know this is something again you should google and there are beautiful documentaries of these housewives just going there you know why telling the men so what used to happen this was happening in new york what what used to happen that some men had white men had voting powers and then they had to vote every year whether there should be more people included in it or not and all the white men said no we don't want black men we don't want women and this was a convention in which all women got together to plead with the men to get them these rights if you read this con corner it says woman suffrage headquarters in ohio men of ohio sorry because uh, they were talking to the men of ohio give the woman a square deal vote for this amendment okay so this is how women started coming together most of these women if you read about them these were housewives they had two three children they used to drag their children along go rally and meet together and talk about very very normal uh, everyday problems which they were not nobody was hearing even at home and they felt that it is the power to vote which is going to give them this right okay so the first movement really for was for this political good and uh, basically it took them a lot of time till they about a century when they actually got the universal suffrage in us all right from there it spreads everywhere what happens to indian women any idea did they fight for it as well yeah. women fought for rights for uh, savita bai phule was the first Sorry? Savita Bai Phule was the first educated uh, woman. Uh, yeah, she wrote. Savita did she fight, fight for. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, uh, right. Yeah. She fought for the education of women. Ha, no, I'm talking about political rights. Political rights. Right to vote. How did Indian women get the right to vote? Absolutely right. So for Indian women, the whole thing was. almost designed by the time they got independent because remember for women the biggest movement was the independence movement and i'm sure you know this gandhi as a uh, communication person gandhi who got women into the freedom fight you've heard, you i'm sure you've read all this in your history of journalism right that is where women of india did not have to go through this kind of next please the second wave is something that we call from 63 i want to quickly tell you what was look at the red thing now next thing that the women wanted when they got their uh, suffrage was equal pay act that everybody should be paid equal what do you think is indian situation on this do we have equal pay in india Yes, ma'am. Example, no, ma'am. Example, please. 
Yeah, but you're not wrong. Yes, yes. Female labors are not given the same amount that male labors are being. Ha. Huh, so yes, ma'am. Who who said yes, ma'am? They're paid. You're right. Just elaborate. Yeah. I mean, multinational companies, women are, are at higher posts than men, so they get... A post is different, beta. A post, uh, you see, pay means two people on the same post, man getting more and woman getting less. Remember, in company, I mean, big companies, the women, men and women at same post also get paid equal. Ha. Huh. I'm not very sure about corporates, but the government, yes. You see, your government of India is one place and all the governments where you pay nobody says that you are a woman so uh, you are secretary you will be given less than the man okay so which means ki in the country we do talk of equal pay but i agree with most of you who say no because in unorganized sector like you were saying there is no equal uh, payment and even in your media you do not get uh, paid at the same uh, level Right? Okay. So ma'am, 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 ma'am. This is Indian cricketers now, cricket association have equaled the, the salary of men and women team. Which was in the news, which was a big news. All right? Right? But so, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we are still de getting there. And corporates, uh, the, the guy who's very glamorized by corporates, no, corporates also do not do that. They discriminate. Okay? But yes, overall they pay more than the government. So it sort of evens out in our mind, but it doesn't in their uh, situation. So I also want to uh, say something about the unequal pay of uh, people. It's, uh, it's majority of the time in the politics as well as cinema. Like my mother often says about one film in which the leading actor was paid 50 crores and the actress was paid 2 crores. So this kind of discrimination, what do you have to say on discrimination in cinema and politics also? Everywhere, I said that, except for government. In cinema, uh, cinema in my understanding, cinema, media are always the bad examples really when it comes to uh, equality or equal uh, or forget equality, discrimination. I think uh, women are definitely discriminated. Women's identity does not matter, their role does. I absolutely agree with you. Media is one place and that is why you people need to know this. That's why you know the whole attempt is to make you aware so that going forward the tentativeness which i saw in some of you who think everything is okay should be questioned i'm not saying change or convert but i'm saying question at least okay so i want to ask uh, one thing about cinema that i want to make my career in cinema so what can i what should i do to make a big name in it as um, big as the male people like uh, if i want to be a filmmaker so many lady directors are not uh, given that much uh, um, payment uh, payment or sometimes they are not as much recognized as the male filmmakers in the mainstream cinema so what can i i do or the other females like me can do so you want to be a filmmaker huh? film director behind the camera right so i'll tell you what you should do you should not worry about those things you should be conscious question concentrate on your art and your talent when you are talented these things become easier to handle all right don't let these negative things become negative as in things which are challenging become a reason for you to stay back now that my dear is what these patriarchal systems want to do please never be deterred and when is it that you become brave to face adversities when you know about them and you not accept but yes you know about it that's why it's important to know, yes, it's a very difficult system. It's a system that's going to discriminate. But if I am best and if I, as a filmmaker, am telling stories that people want to hear, then nobody can stop you. It isn't that we don't have women. We have women everywhere. We don't give them the limelight. And that is one thing that I'm going to talk about when we talk about our Indian situation. Okay, one book that I want all girls to at least sort of read or see Feminine Mystique by Brett, uh, Betty Friedman, okay? Now, this is something 
that for the first time started questioning something that was very important and today also is debated. Betty was of the opinion that it is the home and domesticity which is responsible for the discrimination that women face. Okay? It is difficult to digest in our context because family is so important for all of us. right? But according to Betty, it was the home, the private domain of family which was most exploitative and problematic for women and their opportunities to grow. So, this is something that you have to keep in mind when you are looking at situations going forward. Two important things that I want to quickly flag off. The last one which is that it is in this time from 60s onwards that we saw that a movement which was a political movement started getting into the academic world. What do I mean by that? I mean that for the first time the academicians who were teaching because they had now got the education, there was universal suffrage etc. When they started reading history, theory, uh, maths, anything, they realized that there were no women there because women had traditionally not been a part of the teaching. Therefore, whatever was said, whichever poems, whichever um, uh, stories, whichever writing was there available for them as education and education is something they had fought for. Why do we want to get educated to be knowledgeable? It is important to understand that women realize there is no woman's story, there is no woman's voice. There is not anything that women feel and that is being talked about. So, women's invisibility in academia is a matter of concern, right? And this is something that even you need to look and see whether you people think it is still a problem. I think it is. I do not find enough of women's voices, I do not find enough of women's opinions. I do not think it is even taken seriously. Back in the, uh, you know, in the example of the corporate, this is where we have to see how many women are in the top places, how many women are owning, uh, you know, news agencies, news um, uh, media houses. Therefore, how many women are controlling the content? To be on top means what? That you are going to be the one who is going to decide what is going to be out there what is going to become the culture, what is going to become the social norm. So, this is one of the very important thing which came into being and you must be aware that even in India we have the uh, women's centers. Have you been to colleges, schools which have women's centers? Yeah, even IGNU has one in case you are sort of you know familiar. So, a lot of people do women's studies in their masters. What is the whole idea? The whole idea is to be able to is to develop the thought, is to be able to bring out what women say, all right, not what men say. And the second thing that I want to talk about here is this National Black Feminist Organization because it is the second uh, uh, movement, second uh, stage of this uh, feminist movement when the black women uh, brought up a very important aspect and this is very applicable in India as well, saying that this movement is white women's movement. Their problems are white women's problem. So, what was a white woman's problem? Her problem was that she did not have franchise, she did not have education, she did not have uh, right to vote and all those things. But the black women who were poorer, they did not have the water, they did not have jobs, their husbands were lowly paid their husbands would drink and beat them. So, the black women came up in this stage from 63 onwards to say that I do not see eye to eye with your feminism because your issues are anyway luxury, you also exploit me. Now, let me talk about this in our situation. Today you think women are in a good position, most of us are quite emancipated, we go to offices, we drive our cars, we have money, right? But what happens to our homes when we leave our house? Who takes care of our home? The didis, the ayas, right? Who we pay, we do kit kit also, 
you never came to our house during covid i am going to cut your salary familiar right who are these women these are also women who are not only exploited in the same system they are also exploited because the women exploit them do you get that and i'm sure you do right so it was the same situation where those black women said that hey you don't understand my problem my problems are double edged so i am going to go and do my own thing and that is where you see the first split in the movement and this is what led to further splits coming to the third movement can we uh, come to the next slide please 1990 onwards where people started where uh, women's uh, movements began to pick up issues which were no longer universal so if the white women talked about expansion of the gender understanding they said it's not about work it's not about education it's now about sexual freedom and sexual freedom in uh, the american context had a very different uh, notion in it the most important thing we were talking about was reproductive health rights which means right to have or not have a child the abortion uh, rights uh, that is something that is still to this day an issue in america are you people aware of that have you ever read or written anything about those issues it doesn't matter you must because sexual uh, and reproductive health more reproductive health issues are very serious issues in our country also a lot of women in our country do not have that control over their own bodies and therefore they suffer a lot of health issues are because of lack of agency in deciding what is good or not good for their own bodies okay now this is a very important development communication issue if you have ever studied a lot of times we talk about menstrual hygiene we talk about family planning and then we we kind of just think it's all about not having enough children but it is not about just having children it's about being prepared or not prepared having the right to decide or not decide okay it is about not even knowing that this is an issue and why does that happen because these are taboo things in our society right it, it, that that's where the cultural thing comes okay and we'll quickly move to that uh, after i'm done with this uh and we see the white women's issues now are really around capitalism and economy okay the corporate uh, paid uh, wage issues we talk about sexual harassment in workplace now sexual harassment is something that i want to spend a little time on because in the indian context that's very important uh are you guys tired huh shall i go on or are you tired huh <laughs> so sec what is sexual harassment does anybody understand uh, the whole concept unwanted uh, behavior unexpected or an unacceptable behavior at workplace right from men from people of other uh, sex right like pushing more than uh, yeah. men towards an uncomfortable situation yeah 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 absolutely ha huh. okay very very right so now uh, that is something which you have to sort of think a little bit about why does this happen this basically happens it's very easy to say patriarchy but then this is where you have to break down patriarchy what happens is that men are usually not used to being with at least your generation has very good exposure i'm talking about generation before when women would not come out of home and work so men interacted with women only in the family space all right and in the family space we know very well the roles were hierarchical so it was always expected that the woman is in a subordinate situation so when the woman came out to work on the same rank at the same position to the man the interaction because there, there was no interaction of this sort the interaction still had the elements of that patriarchal behavior and men men were just being men you know it isn't like uh they did anything that was odd so 
for your consumption, have you people uh, seen Satyajit Ray's uh, uh, films? Mahanagar. Please see that movie. That's a very interesting movie which makes you understand in an Indian context what workplace harassment, it doesn't have workplace harassment, but it has a perception of what it means for a woman to step out and work for the first time. Okay? So, that is what essentially is the reason that men are not sure, nobody teaches men how to behave with women in a workplace, in a formal setting, which includes school or college. What happens is that our notion of friendships, where does it come from? Where do you learn about friendship? Schools and yeah, yeah, say, say, from yeah, and popular culture, your media, right? A lot of this friendship thing is a very media given thing, right? Constructed outside of social realities, okay? So, these are important elements for you to understand and to understand now in India we have, what do we have? Do, do you know about the 2013 uh, law, the act against sexual harassment, how many of you know about that? Posh, how many of you know about Posh? Yeah. Prevention of? Better wo POSCO hai. Under age is POSCO. Okay? Posh is, no, it's okay. This is, this is the whole thing. You know, you are journalists and because we don't talk about these things, we don't know. So, the POSH is prevention of sexual harassment at workplace which has a lot of rules, please do look it up, which is about a woman is given the right to decide what makes her comfortable or uncomfortable. And even if the boy might say, so sometimes what happens, girls are passing, you are whistling. You may be whistling because you are a good whistler. But that under Posh Act is considered to be offensive. The woman has every right to take you to the law and punish you accordingly, there are punishments. So, it is important for boys definitely to know you are going to be getting into the work culture very soon. What are those elements that you have to be careful about in the presence of women? Now, what happens interestingly, a lot of men will tell you that women misuse that right. Yeah, they do probably. Women misuse the right. But then, just to make a point clear, because I can't go into everything, that there are laws even against that. It's not that women can get away with such a thing. If found sort of guilty of having done that, there are equal reprimanding happening there. Okay. So, the last thing that I want to talk about is that as people moved in different directions, which is feminists moved in different directions, talking about their own uh, place and talking about their own issues, it was very, very evident that feminism as a movement is not one thing. Feminism as a movement is very culturally driven. It is something that is defined by the women of a certain locality, certain place. And as it spread to the rest of the world, one realized that the issues and problems of say black women are very different from white women. And then we get the concept called the intersectionality, which means when you look at a woman's problem, you are going to not look at it from only the gender perspective, you are going to look at it from the uh, other discriminatory uh, sort of systems or institutions, for example, economics. So, as we were just talking about the poor woman and the rich women, they have different problems. Okay? In India, we talk about caste, which I will talk about in a while, but before that, uh, Ma'am, just let's talk about Judith Butler and I want that first film. Uh, we may not see the whole film because it's a little long and I think we already... Please see this and try to understand Judith. So there are many different theories of gender and mine is just one. 
sometimes uh, people who really hate gender name me <laughs> as the one who made this up, but that's actually not true. You know, in my view, everybody has a theory of gender. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that everybody has certain assumptions going about what gender is or should be. And at a certain point in life, we ask ourselves, wow, where did that assumption come from? <laughs> at this point, I'm less concerned about whose theory is right and whose theory is wrong, because the assault on gender is also an assault on democracy. Yeah. So you see, it's a long film, and I do want you to see if you really want to understand how it is, because we don't have so much time. So I basically, uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that it is with the understanding of the women's movement, then we later went to understanding identities as more than what is given. And that led to us expanding women and the binary into a gendered, into a fluid state of gender as we understand it today. Okay, and Judith uh, Butler in wa is one person who is very contemporary for your understanding today because now we do not just talk about the women and women's issues, we talk about all genders together. Because in our academic uh, sort of endeavor and the research, we have come to the conclusion that uh, patriarchy is not only harmful for women or for marginalized, it's actually truly harmful for the men as well, right? So, so the hard head thing which I was talking about is my uh, way of saying that that's what patriarchy expects that men are not going to have a heart and that's so problematic because men do have a heart, right? So uh, let's go to the next slide. So here, suddenly we are back to our own reality. What does this slide tell you? The point I'm trying to make in this slide is that you saw this whole jury, you know, if you see Butler's film, you will kind of be so impressed because there's so much of theory, there's so much of understanding, wow, they really understand uh, what it is to be, to have an identity, etc. Yet the, the ground reality is that uh, United States of America to this day does not have a political head who is a woman. And remember the feminist movement started with the political agenda trying to actually get their political act, uh, you know, equal. And when you look at the subcontinent, and that is where I want to f focus and shift for next five minutes uh, before I leave you, you realize that, uh, well, this happened to us even before anything else happened. We had political power in the hands of women, even though it was backed by structure, next thing, we did see women and we did see women's viewpoint, all right, somewhere at the top. So I am putting a question mark and asking you that we are going to now understand what is Indian feminism or is there anything like Indian feminism. I will draw a parallel. So again, this a definition is pretty much what feminism anyway is meant to be. Let us move uh, Age. And I want to take you down to 1818, uh, where have you heard of uh, Rukhaya Hussain ever before? No? Can you please write this down because this is available. I just took off that thing because I did not want it to. Uh, uh, please look for her story called Sultana's Dream. Written way back in 1800 and something, this is a very interesting f book which uh, she wrote, in which she imagines a world where the women would be out. Because remember, 1818 means the women had no education, women did not go out anywhere, no kind of power, everything was limited to being at home and being powerful within home. And she imagines, she came from an affluent Muslim family, where she imagined what if it was the role reversal? What if men stayed at home and then women could go out on the street? Because in her imagination, being out on the street was a very big deal. Because women that time were in Parda, they were not allowed to go out. This is a practice that still exists in many parts of our country. So, so this is a novel which has actually now been acclaimed as a feminist novel in an Indian context and just as the western counterpart, uh, please move to the next one, 
we talk about Savitri Bhai Phule, whose husband actually and a Dalit himself started the movement of educating women. Right? And therefore, like in the West, education came first and then the ideas came second. All right? Ideas that converted into a movement. That's, that's really the basic point I'm trying to make here. Yes, please. Oh, I have another quick film. Can we just see it for three minutes, please? Because So this is one um, film which talks about a Dalit woman. And I'm deliberately trying to go Dalit here because I'm trying to draw a parallel between the black women's movement and, and the... Yeah, yeah. And the, uh, and the Dalit feminists in India. Are you aware of this term called Dalit feminism? Okay, you should uh, read up. There's Sharmila Rege. There are many people who've talked about how Dalit feminism and Dalit women's struggles are very different from the Sarvana, from the uh, people who are from upper castes. So caste is very important for us to understand not only because it helps you understand the political drama during the elections, but it is important because everyday life of average Indian outside metros is driven mostly by, uh, by the caste politics. Please. Google dedicated a doodle honoring P.K. Rosie on her 120th birth anniversary. P.K. Rosie, the woman who was not only the first actress in Malayalam cinema, but also the first Dalit woman ever to star in a feature film. In this video, let's take a look at her life and work and reflect on the caste politics that function in our society. Rosie was born as Rosamma in 1903 in a Kulaya family in Nandan Kode village, Trivandrum. Belonging to a Dalit subcaste, her family worked as grass cutters on the lawns and fields of the Malayali elite. Her family was impoverished further when her father passed away at a young age and Rosie spent her childhood cutting grass and walking. However, she always had a passion for art and learned acting and theatre amidst opposition from several Pechapur forces at the time. She studied Kakurashi Natakam, a Tamil folk theatre based on tales of Shiv and Parvati's arrival on earth as nomads and performed in a combination of Tamil and Malayali. She was a part of a drama company in Tiruvananthapuram when her talent was discovered by director J.C. Daniel during a performance. Following this discovery, in 1928, she went on to act in the director's pioneering debut, Vigatha Kumaran, The Lost Child, at a time when social conventions and attitudes kept women far from the silver screen, Rosie became the first leading lady in Malayalam cinema through her role in the silent film. For a Dalit woman to be cast in a leading role as an upper-caste Nayar woman and be recognized as an artist, was a courageous step against male upper caste dominance. Naturally, it offended a majority of the viewers and was met with resentments. The film was screened on 7th November 1928 at Capital Cinema in Tiruvannathapuram. On the first day of the release itself, the film was received with outrage, especially by men belonging to the upper caste Nair community. Already high established members of the Malayalam film industry refused to watch the screening as long as P.K. Rosie would sit among the rest of the audience. She was eventually disinvited from the first public screening of her own film. Reportedly, the film had a scene showing her lover, played by J.C. Daniel, kissing a flower she had worn in her hair, which enraged the upper caste people and resulted in stones being thrown on the screen. Naya went to stop. Kuru. So again, paucity of time, please do look it up. FII is a feminist uh, sort of website in, in India. You can just look it up and there'll be lovely stories like that. Now to answer your question, dear, we are talking about Rosie. Hello. You asked me the question about today's time and how you think being a director. We're talking about 1928. And Rosie did it. And we are watching her today in 2023. So it isn't like, you know, this hasn't happened and nobody knows and nobody comes out of it. We do. Okay. Let's move to the next slide, please. So a very quick, I mean, I don't have time right now, but I really wanted you to, to look at this other uh, document. And this I'm trying to draw the parallel from uh, the Western side where the academia took over. In India during 1974, for the first time, two uh, economists, Veena Majumdar and Lothika Sarkar, who was a lawyer, they were given by the government to uh, look at 
do an analysis of what happened or what is the situation of Indian women. All right. So Towards Equality is a document that every journalist should read. If you haven't been told about it till now, please, uh, it's available on the net. This will make you understand and answer all those questions that you have about what is feminism, what is not. Okay. And this was uh, a particular um, study which made people understand, which made the government understand that there is need to look at women who are marginalized in terms of economic, social order and political power. Yes, ma'am. Next. Uh, and I wanted to stop here and tell you how many of you know of all these problems of women today? What do you think these problems do? You know, are you aware that we have laws that take care of each one of these problems? Hmm? And yet, each of this issue has become a political movement. Paucity of time again, but the thing is that for each I have something or the other to tell you in order to bring to your mind that what happened in the West and in the globe very much has a mirror image in an Indian subcontinent. So, while movement and feminist movement is, is a Western concept, it is not something that is not relevant to what is happening here. Therefore, <clears throat> please never get into this pseudo feminism, it is a Western construct, does not happen in India, it does. All the issues that are uh, given here, dowry domestic violence was when feminist movement went on to the, uh, to the field. There were women who came out, protested and then the laws were made in order to ensure that those who do these crimes uh, are uh, put to uh, some sort of uh, punishment. Women's work, sexual harassment we did touch upon, sexual violence and safety. I think the less I say the more you know, Nirbhaya etc. is something that will go on and on and on. Lands right to women and agriculture. I don't know how many of you know about it, but this is something that you should read up as journalists because this is where we want uh, a lot of reporting happening in order to understand that 80% women work on field, but just about 12 or 13 percent own uh, any land in agriculture, which is such a big discrimination even in today's time when we think we have uh, Dalit women we do uh, touch upon and women's representation in media. That's a new Pandora's box which I'm sure you people have a lot of understanding of how women are represented more in roles than in the identity. So much so, let us wind this up, hmm? that today in the social media situation, we land up with what we call the fourth wave. This fourth wave is something that is globally together. It does not have this region, that region. It has this region, that region issues, but the thought is together and the Me Too movement is something that I think you again you people are aware of, but we could have talked about it. Yes, next ma'am. So, this is where I would have paused and now told you people that if at the end of this discussion you can adopt feminism as an approach, not anything else but an approach, which means anything and everything that I do, I look at it from that point of view of women, what is happening to their voice, what is happening to their visibility. If you apply these concepts at home, at workplace or while you are looking at the posters, making and developing those content, which is the part of the media and society, I think my lecture would have done its job. Next ma'am, now that is it because this to my, <laughs> thank you, this to my understanding is something that you have to do. I do not have, uh, you know, more than this to say, but then it is you who are going to set up the feminist uh, ideology going forward, the uh, personal agendas and build an identity which goes much, much beyond the roles that you are born into. Thank you.
Thank you, ma'am. The session was really interactive. Now I request Dr. Susmita Bala, Professor and Head DME Media School and Chief Associate Convener of ICANN 6 to give her concluding remarks. We are talking about feminism. We have talked about a lot of things, a lot of things. It is very important for you. Ma'am talked about different waves and shared lots of information. The theme is so broad and time is so less. We can't cover so much of the issues in a very small time. Cover nahi kar sakte the. Some of you have a bit of knowledge of this subject and I am sure you would have understood the things in a better way. Ma'am ne jo last mein kaha, set your personal approach regarding, regarding this feminism. Bahut important hai, kyunki this is not only lecture, this is your approach. Hum kya samaj rahe hai, kya seek rahe hai, kaise samaj rahe hai. So this is not only lecture, isko absorb karoge, then you can improve yourself and learn better than this. Film ma'am bola, do film dekhne ke liye, aap usse dekhenge to aapko bohat knowledge hogi. Kyunki humare India abroad, sari jage, jiski bhi baat ma'am ne ki, uske alawa bohat kuch seekhne ke liye, you are students of journalism and mass communication. So learn lots of things about this so thank you ma'am thanks a lot with this we come to the conclusion of this session i would like to thank professor and dean dr mathali ganju for her valuable time and sharing her knowledge with us i extend my gratitude to the management and leadership team of dm Heartfelt thanks to Professor Dr. Amri Saxena for his guidance, Dr. Susmita Bala for giving us directions and support at every stage of the conference. Special thanks to the faculty members and staff of Media School for executing all the sessions. I would also like to thank the production and the technical team for providing the technical support. Special thanks to the newsletter and media coordination and social media team for the coverage of the event. I would also like to thank the designing team for the creative support, I also wish to thank the administrative staff of DM. Special thanks to the conference partners, knowledge partners, international partners and media partners. The recordings of all the sessions of ICANN 6 can be accessed through our official YouTube channel DME TV, our social media handles ICANN page and DME page and subscribe to DME TV. Next we have technical session 3 on the topic role of consumers and influencers in digital marketing, branding and advertising which will be delivered by Pooja Mahesh, Associate Professor, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, Dubai. This is an ongoing session which is now currently taking place at Zoom. Now, I, Tripti, along with my co-host, Essika, will now take your leave. Till then, stay tuned for many more exciting sessions at Thank you. 6.